OK, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Graham Johnson from the Allen Institute, and I've been working with Caitlin Casmo in the back here. Um, and today, we want to give an opportunity for three um, educators who have been using materials available on our website in the classroom to, to, to present to you the very diverse ways uh, they've been presenting this material and using it um, to, to a broad variety of educational audiences. This is kicking off a new effort to uh, generate and provide educational resources on our website at allencell.org. And I'll describe later how that process is only just beginning. And so we're really interested in having conversations with everyone about um, what the needs are and how we should develop these tools. As everyone in the room knows, cells are the structures of everything that lives and everything that dies. We therefore want to understand cells to better understand our na the nature and to better understand ourselves. And the first step in the scientific method is observation. So to begin to understand how cells function and perhaps the various ways that they can misfunction in disease, we first need to be able to see them and describe all the components inside of them. And at the Allen Institute for Cell Science, we're diving deep into this first step of observation by building 3D atlases of whole cells. So I'm showing here on the right uh, a movie taken from our microscopes, a time series of mitosis. And on the left is a, a segmented cell that comes from a label-free technology where we're able to see multiple structures inside of cells directly from the bright field microscopy. So we're just one of a few large efforts around the globe working to see, define, measure, and describe the location, amounts, and shapes of all the major components inside of cells. And we're using human cells in this case. So at the Allen Institute, we chose to study human-induced pluripotent stem cells because they have stable genomes, they can be grown in culture, replicate, and they can be induced to differentiate into a number of different cell types, as you can see on the right. They have tons of genetic and pharmacogenomic information coming in from precision medicine efforts. So in general, we get a lot of bang for the buck by using these cells as our model organism. At the Institute, we grow our cells in these 96 well plates, and they, they form small colonies, which are mono layer sheets. When we look at them in time series, they, the, the colonies move around, and there's a ton of active uh, activity inside. You can see the arrows in the, in the center image of cells growing and dividing. And one of the big challenges is that, that we can, as I toggle this image on the far right, uh, we can see a lot of activity with the bright field images, but when we highlight one structure at a time using fluorescence microscopy, we can really help things stand out and, and better understand their structure. So we've gone to the trouble of, of gene editing several structures in the cells because the cells look better, they seem to live longer and in a more native state. And compared to the overexpression artifacts that you see on the right, the cells tend to be happier and healthier because they're just expressing the proteins at their native amounts. Um, and they, they help us see the structures much more clearly. So we can watch the cells over time. And the GFP remains present and consistent. Uh, it targets all the cells. And it's less harmful to the cells compared to most types of dyes and labels. Um, so we get better resolution and less background. And using the cells that we provide from the Allen Institute labs, such as the Freeman lab, uh, which I'll describe in these images on the right, have been able to compare, compare individual organelles to learn how they differ in the diseased mini kidneys compared to healthy models. So on, on, the, on the left, we've been working to differentiate our cells into cardiomyocytes. Um, which are fascinating to just watch beating in the dish after several days, as you can see in the upper left. And they form these, these beautiful myofibril structures on the bottom. 
And some people have adopted the cells that we make available, um, and you can see the comparison of healthy kidney uh, organoids in the dish in the top left compared to the blistered ones on the right. And when they use the cells that we've developed, they have the opportunity to put the cells through that same process, and then they compare, they can compare individual structures that have been labeled one at a time um, to, to really begin to see the details of the microtubules, the mitochondria, the Golgi apparatus, what, what changes are, are going on. We have provided all of our tools and data to the world in a variety of formats, and we, we, uh, one of our major goals is to make it as accessible as possible, and this is where I start to lead into tools that have been adopted by our presenters coming up. One of these tools is a, a three-dimensional viewer for volumetric data sets called the 3D Cell Explorer. And it offers a gallery of what is now up to about 35,000 cells, um, which can be opened directly in a web browser. And it has all of the common features you would expect of a volumetric viewer, where you can turn structures on and off, you can change colors, you can adjust contrast. Um, you can look at the segmentations, or you can look at the raw data. You can look at them in two dimensions or in three dimensions. And a project we released in April is called the Visual Guide to Human Cells. <clears throat> this was also written to summarize, sorry, that's, let me get this playing here. Sorry, that didn't play. I guess we'll just have to help. Uh, if you come to the booth later, you can try the real thing, or you can try it uh, on your own devices. Um, this Visual Guide to Human Cells, it, it takes a ton of information and observations that our biologists have collected over the, the last three years. Uh, it summarizes it on the right-hand side, and we've organized all of the information across our website on a per-structure basis, and we've organized those structures into functional categories. Um, it's not targeted specifically at an educational audience, but it's written uh, with a broad enough language that um, educators have been able to adopt it. So if you have taken a cell biology class in the last 50 years and maybe you don't remember exactly what a TOM20 protein is and its role in mitochondria, um, we have descriptions of that on the right, as well as movies of the cells undergoing time lapse and uh, more detailed information and illustration about the structures and the proteins that have been tagged. So again, we're, we're aiming to provide a growing number of resources on this web page. And when you see the visual cell in action, I just want to point out one of the complexities of it is that our data is collected at the resolution of optical microscopy. And on the left, you'll see uh, an old textbook illustration I did um, describing the detailed structures of each of the organelle systems in a cell at the resolution uh, at, at proper scale relative to one another. So the mitochondria are quite large. The ER are on the order of 30 nanometers across, microtubules 25 nanometers in diameter. And then when we, we look at that same information through optical microscopy, it's getting blurred out to a resolution like this. Um, so it's important to convey this kind of concept to students that they understand what they're looking at when they, when they see something called microtubules on the visual guide. Uh, it might not have the striations that it, that it does in the illustrations that they're typical, um, that, that they're used to looking at from molecular resolution instruction. But we are making strides towards improving that so a new rendering technology we're developing takes our cell images that look like this on our web viewer and in most popular volumetric viewers that are available. Um, it can render them to give you much better information about where structures lie in the Z dimension. Um, and we can get a great deal of clarity from that as well. So you can much more clearly understand the structure of the, the spindle bodies versus the astral microtubules versus the 
uh, microtubules in the interface cells surrounding this mitotic cell in the middle. And you can, again, understand spatial relationships. Here we're looking at tight junctions sitting uh, labeled in white with the GFP uh, sitting on top of uh, DNA stained in blue and um, a bit of the cell membrane stained in pink. And I put up one more of these cells just to show you how well something like prophase, the condensation of the DNA uh, in that uh, top cell is, is just amazing and really stands out compared to when you're trying to look transparently through the entire data set. So towards the end, Caitlin's going to come up and uh, remind you that, that we're really interested in um, learning how we can adopt these tools for educational purposes and what new tools or new data we could build to, to specifically target audiences. But now we're going to begin by introducing Carlos, who's going to talk about how they've already adopted these research tools in their as-is format uh, for teaching in the classroom. Thank you. So thank you for inviting me. So my name is Carlos Galler, and I am an assistant professor in the biotechnology program at North Carolina. So I had the pleasure of teaching molecular biology classes to freshmen all the way up to first and second year grad students. And one interest we have is exposing them to cutting edge, high throughput techniques. In some cases, that's hard because those require expensive equipment, or knowledge of methods that can be really complex. So that's where this collaboration with the Allen uh, Institute has been really fantastic. So I want to tell you a little bit today about how we're using the Cell Explorer to introduce specifically high throughput approaches in molecular biology and image analysis, high content Im image analysis, through the use of educational case studies. So I'll first give you a, um, an overview on what are high-throughput molecular biology approaches. Then we'll talk about the educational case studies. Then I'll tell you about the HITS network that we've created to partner educators and researchers to design case studies, particularly for high-throughput molecular biology approaches. And I'll give you an example of an exciting case study we're developing with the Allen cell. So first, let me start by asking you a question. I know it's early on, but you're seated next to neighbors. What are high throughput approaches? Take 30 seconds to talk to the people next to you. And the teacher in me is going to make you what do you think are high throughput approaches? Okay. So what, what were some things that you came up with, with your definitions? Does someone want to shout something out back there? A lot of data that can be summarized. Good. So lots of data points. Something else on that side. Mm. Okay. Ooh, automated and unbiased. I like that. Okay, so my approach, this is just my definition. I think high throughput approaches in molecular biology take advantage of miniaturizing, often miniaturizing reactions or miniaturizing using microfluidics. They often use automation. So don't fear the robot. The robot in molecular biology can help us and massively parallel technologies. And all these come together to help us learn about genes, phenotypes, or complex interactions. 
So my challenge is how do we teach students about these cutting edge approaches? How do we allow students to experience the excitement? Because I think fishing expeditions and I think high throughput approaches are exciting. How can we uh, transfer that or expose students to those exciting um, uh, features of some of these technologies? So to do that, I think we can use the educational case study. So again, take 30 seconds, talk to the person next to you, and what is an educational case study? Do you use them? Okay, so I'll stop you there. What do you think is an educational case study? Someone from this side. Okay, so uh, maybe, can I say, maybe a scenario or some, uh, some piece of data, good. Someone over on that side. Perfect. So you start with an example or a story and you work backwards and look at the methods. So um, my definition, and I'm partly biased by my teaching mentor, Pat Marsteller um, at Emory, so my definition of a case study is an engaging, realistic scenario. It can be fictional, but it has to be realistic, that provides students with an opportunity to interact with data and approaches through maybe an example or a subset of data. They can work individually or in groups, and the goal is for them to learn about fundamental processes and concepts through challenging questions. So these questions, they have to work on a, for a, a, a couple of uh, periods, or they have to do research online, or they have to really dive into the data sets to understand. So I love case studies. I love high throughput molecular biology approaches. And what we found is, was that there were not that many case studies that particularly addressed high throughput molecular biology uh, approaches. So Sabrina Robertson, my colleague now at UNC Chapel Hill, and I were really, um, uh, um, were really taken by the fact that when you search for keywords high throughput in some of the educational case study literature or databases, you couldn't find much. So we put together uh, a network that we called HITS, and the goal was, uh, this is a National Science Foundation um, um, project, and the goal is to put together in the same room people that usually don't talk to each other. So we have educators who are teaching classes, undergrad uh, through grad school. We have graduate students and postdocs who are developing these approaches institutes like the Allen Institute that are making data public, that are using these awesome approaches, and bring them together so that we can create really authentic case studies with data that is big data, that is, there's a lot to mine. And students have the opportunity to learn about the approach, mine the data, and maybe find some interesting trends. So we call this uh, the HITS network, alluding to when chemical screens were done and you would find a HIT and you would jump because you found the next antibiotic. The HITS network aims to really create that environment where case studies use authentic data, students are driven by inquiry, they can find new trends in data sets that have not been mined that much. So. HITS stands for High Throughput Discovery Science and Inquiry-Based Case Studies for Today's Students. 
Sabrina has an awesome knack for coming up with acronyms. And the case studies are designed for high school students through early grad students. Uh, we have a, a summer sessions, we have a web uh, community, and we want all our cases to be open source, available so that people can adopt, adapt, and implement. And that's where, when we were looking at high content microscopy, someone mentioned uh, the Allen Institute, I think Sabrina mentioned the Allen Institute, and there was this incredible, beautiful data set of images. Uh, of cells. And this was an excellent opportunity to talk about high content microscopy and high content uh, screening. So our uh, goals are to create case studies uh, and particularly with the Allen Institute, we've created a case study where we have a scenario up here, part one. We have a scenario where we try to engage students in a realistic uh, uh, situation that may happen in the research lab and make them question misconceptions about organelle size and structure, variation in large populations of cells. And to do that, we take them to the Allen Cell Explorer 3D Cell Viewer. We take them to the Visual Guide to Human Cells. We have them learn about how the ER is uh, visualized how they tagged cells, how they used uh, high throughput and high content microscopy to create some of these data sets. And through this guided experience, we exposed them to new approaches, new data sets, and they get to work with lots and lots of images and look at cell variability online. So the goal here was to empower students with high throughput awareness. That HT stands for high throughput in molecular biology. We want them to look at the data sets, discover new trends, look at some of the cells, for example. We have cells that have been uh, normal ER structure as well as cells that have been subjected to a drug, paclitaxel. And we want them to look at the variability in organelle structure in treated cells versus untreated cells. So high throughput data sets such as this one and the tools that the Allen Institute have created allow us to explore natural cell variation. So some of the take home messages I want you to take home from this are that high throughput approaches don't have to be really complicated and uh, inaccessible to even high school students or, or grad students. We want them, since they're becoming increasingly common, we want students to learn about the methodology behind them. So as they dive into the Allen Cell Viewer, they should learn how these data sets were created. Uh, they provide, these approaches provide an opportunity to uh, reinforce fundamental concepts, cell morphology, and exercise quantitative skills. They can use the viewer to measure the different, um, different organelle sizes or different structures, look at staining. And case study, the educational case study, provides a guided experience for students to explore natural cell variation through high throughput and high content data sets. So with this, I hope you can reflect on some of the resources that are available, some of the initiatives that we have to develop more case studies that you can adapt and use in your classes. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, but we can create resources that you can use in different level courses. I'm using it in an upper level class where I want to emphasize some of the automation but we can use it to really address misconceptions in cell structure. And I leave you with this. Uh, I want you to reflect on how can you adapt these tools and data sets and create cases that promote inquiry on the student side, side as well as awareness of these high throughput approaches that are being used in molecular biology. And the Allen um, Cell Explorer provides an excellent tool to dive into these beautiful images and learn about the methodology. With that, thank you.
stand up. Next, we have Tom Martinez. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Martinez. Um, I come to you from the great state of Illinois, where it's very, very cold. I don't want to go home today, but I have to. Um, we are using Allen Cell Resources in AP Biology and also in biotech course that I teach uh, to enhance cell visualization. And um, a little something about our school, we are not a magnet school, we are not uh, some kind of a, a special school where only the bright kids go. We are a regular high school. And uh, what's great about it is that everybody at our high school is eligible to take biotechnology. Everybody in our high school basically at this point is, is encouraged to take an AP course. And so we have a tremendous number of students taking these, uh, these courses. And uh, you can notice here we're, we're pretty low income. We have a lot of kids with um, disabilities. And we're extremely diverse, which is great. And uh, we use that to our advantage uh, lots of times. And so uh, when I became involved with the Allen Cell uh, group, um, I was looking for an educational piece. Uh, I've taught high school biology for 38 years. And for years and years and years and years and years, you get this. And I think this breeds misconceptions about what cells really look like and what cells do, the proportions, the structures, the functions. And I, and I can remember very clearly asking students about a nucleus. And, I, and it was a loaded question. I said, what, what color is a typical nucleus? And they all said purple. And I was like, <laughs> OK. And what color is a cell membrane? And they're like, orange. And I, was, and I, and I thought, this is, this is wrong. And, and so they have this, this concept of cells that's really kind of skewed. And so um, almost three years ago now, I went to a stem cell symposium in Madison, Wisconsin, and I met Rick Horwitz, and uh, he was doing a presentation about the 3D viewer. And he had made mention of the fact that this is kind of like Google Maps for cells. And I was, wow, this, this seems like a really cool idea. And so I met with him after he did his presentation, and we've been communicating. And um, he directed me toward how to use the 3D viewer and some of the other resources that the Allen Institute has available. And now I routinely use this in my classroom. And so I use it to try to eliminate misconception. And so um, a couple of weeks ago, we started working with the 3D cell viewer. And students were blown away. When 17 and 18-year-olds are like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever for two straight days, it meant something to me, and it, and it kind of it, it told me that this, I was onto something. Um, and so this young lady is working on day one with the, the 3D cell viewer. What allows us to do is, is drill down into the cells a little bit. And so my concept of teaching biology is visual, tactile, and kinesthetic. If I can get those three things into lessons, then it's a win. And this is extremely visual. And so uh, my students understand that if you really truly want to understand biology, you need to understand how cells work uh, structurally and functionally. And so here are some students working with the Visual Guide to Human Cells. I really like this one. This was um, something that was relatively recently um, produced. It is a tutorial. And so I can talk about cell energetics, and I can turn them loose researching mitochondria before we even start talking about the nitty-gritties about what mitochondria do and what cell respiration is about. And so it's really nice to help frame students in their, uh, their understandings. Um, here's, uh, again, some other uh, students uh, understanding cell form and function in a, in a really kind of a totally different way. This blows their mind because it doesn't look anything like what they've seen before. Our goal is to take the flat two-dimensional to the three-dimensional to the cell culture. And so somehow, through some miracle, I convinced my school district to build a mammalian cell culture lab. That's the only one in Illinois um, uh, attached to my, my teaching space. And so students are working on passaging cells, and they look super excited. And um, it allows us to kind of bridge this two-dimensional to three-dimensional three -dimensional to living dynamic functional cells. And so you can see I don't have a lot of um, text up here. These are just students doing work. And they love it 
I can't, I can't believe how many kids have said, this is the coolest thing I've ever done. Using a serological pipette was the coolest thing they've ever done in their whole life. And, and, it, and it, it's really funny. And so these are just kids that are, are actively engaged. And their, their takeaway is that they've had a real experience. They've had an opportunity to look at eukaryotic cells, to grow them, to passage them, to eventually stain them. Um, here are some students doing the traditional work on the left. And then uh, we have a Zoe uh, where we're doing um, fluorescent photography with DAPI and MitoTracker. And so um, the takeaway is really, really tremendous. And what's interesting is that students, most of my students are, are female. Most of them are juniors. And they're going to prospective colleges and universities. And those colleges and universities are blown away by the fact that we have an opportunity to do this. I think making the connection to living cells will be much more difficult with two-dimensional imagery like we see in books uh, versus what we have with the Allen cell um, materials. Um, just in conclusion, and I, I have a lot to say, but I'm, I'm pressed for time. Um, the, the Allen cell materials that are, are available are phenomenal. And the kids love it. And you can see here, I have two little quotes. I went home and taught my dad how to use the Allen cell 3D viewer. And he was blown away. We did it for two hours. And this is a special needs kid. And it really made a connection with him. He's a very visual kind of person. Um, I had no idea that cells have so much stuff in them. That came from another special, uh, special needs kid. And so the message is out there. And it's clarified by using the imagery that's available. Most people don't have the luxury of having a mammalian cell culture lab with them. An endpoint could be the, uh, the 3D viewer. And so it's just how you tailor your curriculum to, to, to meet your needs. Um, just a, a final uh, uh, item to mention is that as, as a high school teacher, I'm coming from a whole different realm than you are, uh, most of you. And my goal is to put the skip in their step because a lot of them, when I get to them, have already decided that science isn't for them. They come out of my classroom with a whole different experience, and that skip is back in their step. Thank you very much. Have a good day. And pass this along to Eric. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. I'd like to start by thanking you for coming and also the Allen Institute for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so I'm going to give you a really concrete oops, example of how to use the Allen Institute's uh, cell viewer to, to provide a virtual laboratory on cell division. And since we're at ASCB EMBO, I don't have to tell you how important cell division is to biology. But I thought I'd mention that um, teaching cell division to students is, is problematic, and this has been appearing in published literature for a very long time. Um, the earliest paper I found was actually published in 1924, almost 100 years ago. And um, you can still find papers being published in this decade about how difficult it is to get students to retain the information about cell division. And I think the reason for this is primarily this is how we teach students about cell division. We give them this cartoon uh, of images that don't have any bearing in reality. They don't have any connection to the students. And we give them a bunch of names that they have never seen before. And we ask them to just basically memorize what's going on. Um, so I learned about cell division in the laboratory of Patricia Wadsworth at UMass Amherst as a graduate student. And there, I was able to see cells in this kind of fashion, where you can, these images are just beautiful and, and um, engaging. And you want to learn more about them. They really captivate people. And um, Dr. Wadsworth had a laboratory exercise for her students where she actually took, um, gave them cells and had them fix the cells and then stain them with reagents that allowed them to see this, these types of images for themselves, um, which was a, a very engaging and effective way to teach cell biology to students. So my teaching, I should say I'm at Washington State University, which is um, not in Seattle. It's 400 miles from Seattle, and it's uh, five miles from Idaho. So it's a sort of a different environment. Um, and I teach in uh, large format classrooms. We have one class I teach in has got 500 students in it. Um, and I also do a fair amount of online teaching, and then I do some outreach teaching in um, area high schools. And so all of these environments are very challenging places to give students hands-on uh, learning experiences. Um, 
So I was really excited when I uh, learned about the Allen Institute's uh, data sets that they were making publicly available because um, in just in looking at the, the introductory uh, image that you come up with on their website, you're immediately reminded of the kinds of things that I saw in Dr. Wadsworth's laboratory. Um, these are beautiful, engaging images, and they're also human cells, so students you know, and, and, and I immediately had a connection uh, to these, uh, these objects. And in particular, I was um, intrigued by not so much the, the individual cells at, at super high resolution, which are amazing, um, but actually these uh, images of groups of cells that are on the website, because they reminded me of the types of research experiments that I've done in my laboratory um, and, and in Dr. Wadsworth's laboratory, where we take images of groups of cells and then quantify some parameter of, of that's appearing in the, in the population. And then after taking several images, we arrive at some kind of a scientific conclusion. So I thought this could be the basis of a teaching uh, uh, exercise for students. Um, and in particular, I thought cell division would be an obvious one to, to start with because, um, for example, in this image, there's about 12, uh, 12 cells being shown. Uh, about 88% of them, or about 10 of them, are in uh, not dividing, and two are in metaphase, so about 12% of them are in metaphase. Now, um, there aren't any prophase cells in the slide, so if you want to quantify prophase cells in addition to metaphase cells, you have to look at more images and eventually add all of the data together. Um, so that's what we had students do. Basically, we asked them to read and listen to lectures on cell division and um, get some handle on what's going on. And then we explain uh, how the um, quantitative analysis is going to be conducted, so the sampling, a little bit about how the images were taken. And then we asked them to write down and formulate a prediction or a hypothesis regarding the number of cells that they're going to see in these in these images um, and sort of think about what they're what they're going to encounter and then we have them do the ex we assign them uh, something like 25 30 cell uh, 30 images to go and um, count the number of cells at each stage of cell division um, they analyze their results and then they just they turn in a discussion of whether their results supported their prediction and our goals uh, was to have students understand cell division and its events in sort of a more hands-on way than just looking at pictures in a textbook, um, and also explore data collection and sampling methods and gain some insight into biological uh, research and experimental design. So the implementation of this, well, this is a, you've seen pictures like this before. Um, so it turns out every data set that you're looking at um, in the center of the field of view there um, is actually uniquely addressed by uh, an, an, a URL or a web address, and that's shown on the bottom. And um, the main thing is in highlighted, you can see uh, AICS 12. So 12 is the data series that shows microtubules and DNA, and 550 is the, is the number of that actual image that you're looking at. And you can, uh, for the tubulin DNA combination of uh, data, you can type any number between 1 and 927 in there. Um, and it will be a valid address. And you could, in principle, copy this address and send it in an email to 500 students and have them click on it, and they would, they would see this. Uh, so it's a way of specifying what it is you want students to look at. Um, but that's a very daunting thing to send students. So um, I put this in an Excel spreadsheet with links, and this is how you basically do that. So instead of sending students hyperlinks, um, they just get an Excel spreadsheet that that looks like this. They can click on each cell, and their viewer will open up and take them to the actual image that, um, that I've assigned them to look at. Um, and in principle, you could send this to 500 students, but what if you wanted to have um, 500 students all have their own data set to look at uh, and have each one be unique um, and specific, specific to them? Uh, so I created a Java application that's available on uh, SourceForge, which is a public repository for software. And all it does is it takes a text file with the list of student names and cranks through and it, and it pulls out a random sample of that 927 images, makes each student an Excel spreadsheet, and, um, and puts that out. And then you can upload this to a, a web server or, or email each student their own file, and they get their own unique set of images to, uh, to quantify and analyze. Okay, so um, results. Uh, these are uh, typical results that I get from students uh, after they've completed their analysis. Um, on the left, you can see that they, they, most of them have com, uh, correctly found that interphase is the most common phase. And this is nice because it, it actually 
they, the students themselves reproduce, in essence, the, the types of images that they see in the textbook, but they do it themselves with their own data, which is kind of neat. Um, they, most of them, in thinking about what they're going to see, say that prophase is probably going to be the longest, the, sec the second longest stage of mitosis. Um, because there's so much going on, chromosomes have to condense and the mitotic spindle has to be built. Um, and then on the, on the right, you can see that the, the next most prevalent stage in their data set is actually metaphase. And this kind of surprises students because we teach them that metaphase is just when this, the chromosomes line up in the center of the cell. Um, but actually, that's also the location of a metaphase checkpoint. So the cell pauses um, and make sure that all the chromosomes get to where they're supposed to be before proceeding. And that actually shows up in their data, and they didn't expect that. So there's sort of this discovery moment, and they go, aha, and uh, it all kind of clicks into place for them. Um, so that's the quantitative data that they arrive at, um, which is very satisfying for, for them and for me to see. But even more um, striking, I think, is what the students have said about this. Um, so they say it's, it's very beneficial to look at real data instead of just the cartoons. Um, it says that they say that the exercise has given them insight into cell biological methodology and data collection, which is what I wanted them to be able to do. Um, some students say they, they struggle with the theory of the, you know, the abstract nature of cell biology until they get this exercise, and then it sort of allows them to have a better grasp of the material. Or um, some students like the challenge of taking um, the theoretical knowledge that we teach them in a lecture and actually doing something with it. Um, and the, the best thing is that, you know, it says, a lot of students say, it makes this all actually real to them. Um, so, and I, I want to point out that in addition to just, just being a good teaching tool, um, this is actually a valuable research skill. So you can find publications where um, people basically do this, and I've done this in my own laboratory, where we basically we just take um, images of fields of cells and then count something in them. Um, the mitotic index is a really important research parameter that people look at, and uh, you can even find this in industry. So on the right-hand side, um, this is a 2015 U.S. patent application from a pharmaceutical company, and they did exactly what I just told you about that. So students, um, you can present this to students and say, this is actually something real. It's not just an abstract, I made it up so that you learn kind of thing. Um, if you're interested in doing this, um, uh, a write-up of this has been submitted to a journal called Course Source. It's an online um, STEM education journal. Um, it's peer-reviewed, and uh, they're actually here at the meeting. They're giving a, a, a talk. Um, so if you're interested in publishing your own uh, ideas about teaching um, in a peer-reviewed journal, you can uh, do that. Um, as I said, this has been submitted. Um, I got reviews back which are favorable, so I think they will be, uh, this will be available, and all of the supplemental files will be available as well, including links to the, the um, Java application. Um, and I think that's it. So then I'd like to just finish up by acknowledging uh, my classrooms, which allowed me to use their data. Um, my co-contributors, uh, Erica Offerdahl, uh, is an investigator in um, STEM education at Washington State University. Graham Johnson uh, from, from the Allen Institute. Uh, I'd like to thank, um, acknowledge Paul Allen for his contributions. And then uh, WSU, my professional home, National Science Foundation for funding my lab and uh, again, the Allen Institute for um, inviting me to give this talk. So, thank you.